Thank you very much for having me. And uh, um, I just want to share some of the perspectives that we're seeing emerge because of the COVID uh, pandemic. We must remember that the COVID pandemic in the context of Africa is one of uh, many shocks. And, uh, and so it's an exaggeration of some other uh, shocks on the food system, where we've had an ongoing locust outbreak uh, that has really basically um, displaced internally uh, already 1.7 million people. Uh, it's also exaggerating a food insecurity for at least 25 million people across East Africa. And we know that Africa is by no means homogeneous in its, um, in its face to uh, COVID-19. So particularly when it's struck and as it spreads across the continent, we see uh, different impacts. Southern Africa, when COVID hit, and it has been the hardest hit uh, of, of the regions, and as also being the most industrialized, you see the lockdown, and there most of the countries are harvesting. And this is quite different from uh, our colleagues in West Africa who are actually in the process of planting when uh, COVID hit. So the solutions that you would go if you go uh, sub-regionally would have to be quite different linked to the planting cycle and the food cycle. And what we saw was of course a very big wave of uh, concern around the cases that are emerging, particularly Egypt, Northern Africa, there is slightly different. Southern Africa, they're increasing. And because there is lack of testing, we might have an impression that the impacts are, are much less across the continent where we don't see it. Now, what has happened is a disruption of supply chains. So not only uh, essential, the food coming into the country, it's, uh, and most of the food, about 80, 60% of households across Africa eat foods which are imported off the continent. So this is very big around food availability. That's one major thing. The inavailability of food has skyrocketed the prices, particularly in urban areas, and have and then and, and, and most urban poor dwellers are being impacted because their access directly to food isn't there. We must also not forget that a lot of uh, there's also a lot of outflows where coffee was a major exporter, other cash crops, the disruptions experienced across Europe and other major trading areas, particularly China and etc have meant that the inflows, capital inflows coming into the continent have also dramatically declined. We mustn't forget that the lockdowns globally have hit the African diaspora and remittances, which are largely going, a large lot are going to the smaller states and also to West Africa. This has dried up and that means disposable income uh, to buy food, to purchase uh, in, the inputs, uh, to keep markets rolling and running has suddenly halved. And, and so from the consumption and demand side, there needs to be urgent address there with the vulnerability that we see, uh, particularly amongst the poorer segments. Uh, so what can be done? What, what should we be really looking at um, when we see the disruption of, of these supply chains and, and, and really the impact most of the local rural economies? We're saying we need to be able to fill in those gaps and look at the SMEs that have existed there for quite some time, and these are small agro dealers, they've been active in that space. We also see smallholder farmers who have been able to access, a few who've been able to access loans from microfinance institutions or savings clubs being unable to repay those. So there's market functions that we could come in and support immediately so that those market relationships can continue. We need to solidify where those gaps exist. So that's a, a, a very important bit. There's also a growing number of public markets, particularly in urban, peri-urban spaces, a full school, a school feeding programs for children who've had to be disrupted because schools are closed. So are there new ways of delivering the same goods? Can food systems change? I've seen very cleverly the deployment of motorcycles, all the, the young people on motorbikes now delivering and having spot markets where they can no longer meet in the old, open, urban, huge market spaces in the bid to try and reduce the spread of COVID and to safeguard the health of populations. So how markets are functioning, how food is being transported has had to change. We've lost a lot of jobs, informal jobs in the food de delivery system. So the small outlets of, of food delivery and these have been impacted and there's no safety nets uh, to support them. 
So uh, I think there's a series of, of, of actions and activities that we can bring on board that must also be coupled with right policy responses. Uh, trade, regional trade has really been impacted. For instance, drivers coming from Dar es Salaam going to Kampala and if they're tested positive, is there possibilities of testing from the capital source and then testing and building up infrastructure to support testing and isolation at border posts? Are there other ways in which you can ensure that the food corridors are protected and the frontline workers of those food corridors like transporters, like market vendors, like retailers, have the necessary safeguards that they need. Um, I, I think this crisis has mainly been approached so far from a health perspective, and it, rightly so and should, but it can very easily slip into a food crisis as well if we don't come in with the mitigating uh, actions that are required. Governments have done quite a lot. They've tried to look at stimulus facilities. They're also trying to reduce costs of uh, the, the transfer of remittances, transfers of cash, Mobile phone companies have been leveraged to try and reduce their cost of transfer. There's ongoing discussions about with the banks to see what they can do as a response. Governments have also reduced on taxes just to be able to allow for some uh, activity and, 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 and some economic reflow. But the gaps are really enormous and the, the time is now to step in and bring the needed investments to make uh, the necessary bridge to turn the tide. I think this is absolutely uh, essential. And I will just want to end with the fact that um, most of the airlines have now stopped. We also don't have tourism, which was really one of those synergistic sectors that would support, naturally support agriculture. And because incomes are not coming through there, so you don't get the, you, you get a double um, effect on local economies, which translates to, to rural uh, vulnerable areas as well. So I, I just want to uh, stop there as, as a kickstart to the discussion around how we should be intervening and where big data can come in and give us the necessary uh, highlights onto where we can focus and what would make the difference. Thank you, over to you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, uh, at, at this point, we'd love to open up to any questions from the audience as well as from any of the other panel members. I'll start off. So, um, Sarah, can you tell us a little bit more about some of these long-term um, long-term run-ons from from these impacts? Well, the long-term effects uh, for some of the impacts would essentially be a drying up, for instance, of uh, agricultural inputs uh, and the ability of smallholder farmers to access that. When you have a lockdown situation, access to labor which has been traditionally for subsistence farming isn't there because people are, are locked up. So how can you plant without the necessary series of inputs that you would need? So once you miss one season, in some parts of Africa, you do have two growing seasons and two harvest seasons. Uh, in others, for most rain-fed agriculture, you don't have that possibility. You miss one, uh, negative coping strategies come in, you start eating either livestock and savings or any food stocks that you have. And at the same time, if you don't have a disposable income, then you are really stuck and you have to start skipping meals. So we don't want to get to the point where, you know, there's severe malnutrition and then there's hunger uh, that follows. And I think we have in our means to grasp it. I know that uh, we have price monitors now. Big data is able to trace the spiking of prices and the inavailability of food in some spaces. Um, but where to get this access to this data is a question. Many governments we have been talking to who are borrowed clients are saying, what food stocks do we have in the country where? If you could tell uh, the Kenyan government to say, in these parts, these districts, you actually have net deficit. And in these districts, you actually have a net positive. Then that can also support how you can actually have a net food balance that meets everybody's need in the food system in the country. Thank you. I have a question from Jorge Izar. Um, he asks, could you expand or elaborate more on what specific investments you foresee as instrumental for East Africa at this moment? So thank you for that uh, question, Jose. I think uh, one of the essential investments that we should be looking at is really looking at exploring how our agri input systems work or don't work currently for smallholder farmers. 
uh, most of the time, these inputs are very expensive by the time they reach rural zones closer to the farms, uh, simply because the logistics don't work. Uh, sometimes the roads are, are not effective. We don't have the necessary cold chain systems. We also don't have the necessary logistical, let's say, uh, digital communication infrastructure that is needed that is needed to fast track this. So those are easy investments, they tend to be more, more public or sovereign and, and longer term. So if you get the infrastructure right, you reduce the transaction cost for these inputs. But also we must look at the smallholder and those subsistence spaces. We want them to commercialize so that they can actually run uh, small holdings profitably. And there's a series of necessary on-farm investments that we need to make there. And in order for that ecosystem to work, we've got to invest in the agricultural services. And that's the SMEs that we've been talking about, who are able to provide a series of menu of services, whether it's soil testing, uh, whether it is mechanization services, whether it is you know, pesticide and pest control, uh, getting the right series of, of, of seeds that you know, are linked to soil quality. Those, all those types of investors are really needed to support transformation and transition for smallholder farmers into running commercially viable settings. So we need a package of interventions and not one single thing to help transform the ecosystem in which these communities are operating. Thank you. I have time for just one more question before we move on to the next panelist. Um, so we have a question from uh, Jacinta. She says, um, shutdown prevented some pe prevented people from going to the market, in other words, to avoid the crowd. What was the position of the local farmers who had products for sale? What was precisely the impact? Yes, thank you for that. And that's I come back to the Southern Africa part where they just harvested. They lost, they simply lost the food. And there was lots of milk lost from dairy keepers in some of the countries and others it was fresh produce, tomatoes or vegetables that simply couldn't be moved. And what was missing was simple technology, whether it was for dry goods, for the maize and the grains that they had, or a cold chain that existed where they could store the food uh, as they looked for different ways of trying to get it to market. So this was, uh, this was devastating because it simply lost the crop and they didn't have the market. And so they couldn't earn that. So that was it. Many countries now are introducing using green corridors. What are those green corridors? I see a second question. I'll quickly respond to that. The green corridors are places where you can fast track uh, transport. So if it's food, that's deemed as an essential crop and an essential service, and that is allowed to move. If it's ag inputs, they're also given priority. Any other activities are deemed as non-essential and therefore not necessary to have. So you'd have trucks still moving in many, across many countries, many major cities which are on lockdown, even in districts which are locked down. There were some retailers that were very quick and sharp. That was really interesting. They said, okay, we won't stay in one physical space. We'll hire trucks and they will go to communities and sell there. So you have a truck container and they'll actually sell from the truck some essential goods. So that will reduce communities need to navigate and come into town and correlate. But there's some interesting um, initiatives that could come in if, if we know how much the need is and what the potential could be. So let me stop there. Uh. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. Um, there'll be time to answer some of these questions from the audience um, in uh, a later Q&A session after all the other panelists have, have also spoken. Um, for now, we're going to move uh, on to Andy Jarvis. Um, so Andy Jarvis, he's the Associate Director General of Research Strategy and Innovation of the Alliance of Biodiversity International, SEAT. He is a co-founder of the CGIR Platform for Big Data in Agriculture and a flagship leader on the CGIR Research Program for Climate Change, Agriculture and Food Security. He's based in, and, and he's based in uh, Cali, Colombia. Um, Andy has extensive experience with cutting edge scientific research in developing countries to support the goals of alleviating poverty and protecting essential ecosystem services of importance to humanity. Um, so Andy, would you like to tell us a little bit more about some of the challenges you've seen from the perspective of Latin America and Asia? Sure, thanks. Um, great to be on this and, and talking. You know, I think um, there's lots of jokes going around that we haven't quite reached peak webinar yet. Um, 
that it gets difficult to innovate around presentations. So I, I just thought the, the irony was too much for me not to, not to miss it, to go, to go analog on a big data uh, uh, seminar. So I'll be presenting slides like this over the next three minutes. So, um, you know, for, first of all, what we've been seeing in, in Latin America, we've been uh, doing quite a lot of surveys, uh, kind of commodity focus, looking at rice, for example, in, in great detail of what's happening in, happening across Latin America. Of course, Latin America is a country, uh, is, a, is a region that is as a population which is consuming, but also is a, is a net exporter. It's kind of a, a large contributor to the global food system. So, um, so we've been looking at some of those important commodities like rice, which is, which is traded very much regionally, but also looking at much more local food systems and, and, and uh, producer uh, organizations and things and what's happening on the ground in terms of production uh, on kind of more small scale agriculture. So, you know, the first thing is, you know, just to say that, and, and, and Sarah's kind of mentioned this, the, the, the thing that comes through time and time again is inputs. Um, farmers struggling with inputs. Input prices have gone up because transport has been significantly uh, complicated. Um, so the logistics are hitting inputs, their prices are higher and the access to them is, is lower. And we've seen that both for kind of industrial commercial production and for small scale uh, producers. Um, market, and that's both, you know, kind of uh, small scale producers getting their product to market and selling. Um, Sara again has mentioned this in Africa, it's the same in Latin America, we're seeing food go to waste just because it can't get to market or it can't be sold effectively, um, but also trade, regional trade. So in the rice, rice sector, for example, in Latin America, there's been a lot of reports of just, just difficulties getting regional trade moving. Um, and then the, you know, the third one is, is you know, we're, we're, everyone's thinking and talking COVID, but we've forgotten that we actually have hundreds of problems in the food system under normal co conditions, right? And so Sarah mentioned uh, 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 locusts in East Africa that is decimating. It's just started hitting actually. Now there's a locust swarm in Southern uh, uh, South America in the Southern Cone right now. But um, uh, also uh, we, we surveyed around 3000 kind of farmers and their organizations and institutions across Central America and, and Colombia and um, climate came up. So we're forgetting that there's also, you know, non-COVID related factors uh, uh, exacerbating uh, the situation. So that's, that's on the production side. If we go all the way to the other side, something, there was a, there was a fascinating consumption, a study of consumers um, that came out across Latin America. They looked at four countries and um, they came up with this thing where basically 80% of households are reporting a reduction in what they will be spending. So, you know, the, the economic impacts, be it, you know, through, um, you know, their multiple different uh, uh, streams of income that a household can have, you know, they're, they're reporting 80% of households that they're going to spend less, right? So there's less money for consumption. But an interesting thing, like, uh, is, is that certainly in, in Colombia, for example, there was a, uh, consumers were, were reported to have like a 10, were, were willing to spend up to 10% more than usual on fresh fruit and vegetables. So people are linking the health crisis, COVID, kind of sustainability issues also with diets and health. And so, so there is um, shifts in consumption. So people are more willing and more interested in eating fresh fruit and vegetables, which, which is uh, something you know, uh, of, of interest. Now, you know, so that's those two ends. But if we go all the way back on the supply chain and actually what the, the input, uh, beyond the inputs, you need land, and something that is alarming, and this is a big thing across Latin America, and I think we're going to see a range of reports on this over the coming, coming few months, is deforestation. And so um, this is data that we've been using uh, real-time kind of satellite monitoring of deforestation, the Terra I platform that we, we've, uh, we, we manage. And for example, in the first three months of 2020, there was a 131% rise in deforestation in Colombia versus uh, 2019. Um, and you look at other countries, the same Brazil was around 20%, Chile was high, Venezuela was high. So, so the deforestation is also an issue. And so the, the natural resource base uh, is, is, is also getting impacted. And that's something I think that's really important to watch. Now, the big challenge in all of this is, you know, we have a food system, which is, um, you have a formal sector of the food system where it's, there's the data being collected. We know how much a country is exporting, producing, so on. 
Um, but there's the, the, a large sector of the food, food system in both Asia, Latin America, and in Africa, a majority in many, many of these countries, is informal, right? And in those informal food systems, that's where we need much better data. And I think it's actually one of the areas where we can innovate a lot about use of big data. So, so you know, in, in that informal uh, food sector, for example, something that we had, uh, uh, we were measuring in, in Vietnam was during, kind of before, during, and now um, um, kind of as lockdown is, is, uh, is being raised in, in Vietnam, watching how the markets, the informal markets work. And so we have this excellent uh, the project, which is doing free Wi-Fi in markets. And um, it's monitoring kind of visits and then doing small, very quick surveys of both consumers and sellers about what's happening in these informal markets. And what we saw is, for example, when COVID hit, there was an immediate drop of 23% less visits to these fresh, these uh, wet markets in Vietnam. We, we're continuing to monitor it and it's fascinating to just see how it plays out. And so that's an example of use of pretty good, um, interesting uh, data approaches. So, you know, finally, the, the other thing we're beginning to see now is all of these countries are bringing, bringing out their statistics on GDP. It's shocking, it's depressing, it's terrible economic indicators. When you unpack that, there's a few kind of early reports of GDP figures where it's unpacked at, uh, at sector level. And something is the, the agricultural sector. All sectors are getting nailed. Agriculture is one of the ones that is getting actually um, least, least kind of negative impact in terms of GDP uh, over, over, the, over the first kind of three, four months of the year. So, you know, agriculture, people still need to eat. It is still functioning. Um, and it's actually one of the, one of the sectors that is uh, least, least affected in economic terms. You know, and I think we're going to we're going to start seeing a raft of efforts on the recovery side of things. And I think that's where it's really interesting. There's a whole wave for the recovery to be green. There's a whole narrative around the food system being broken. You know, it's not just it's not equitable. It's not sustainable. And so as we kind of pivot into this recovery, we have the opportunity to fix some of these underlying problems. Um, and I really think it's important that um, that we, we are thinking about how the digital revolution can, can be part of that. Thanks, thank you, Andy. And it's nice to see that you have a, a positive uh, view of, of what's possible in, in light of the innovation that's developing um, from, this, from this crisis. I have a question from Sebastian Pedraza. He asks, how is SEAT and other research centers involving local and traditional knowledge of producers and rural youth with the knowledge produced in these centers and, and in universities? Well, I mean, that, that, that local knowledge is critical, right? It's, uh, you know, that's, that's a part of the innovation system. Um, and a lot of the adaptation that's happening right now in, you know, the farmers and their organizations you know, during this lockdown is in the absence of digital tools, they're quite isolated from other forms of receiving technical uh, technology, re receiving extension and so on. And so, so that 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 that's absolutely critical. Local knowledge is 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 a large part of the solution to many of these these issues. Every all of these problems, we might be able to you know stream off all of these numbers at aggregate level, you know. Uh, but in the end of the day, every farm is unique. Every farm has its own social ecological system, and the person who knows that best is the farmer themselves. Um, and so. That local knowledge is absolutely critical in all of this, and I think you know one of the challenges we have is how do we how do we incorporate that into all of these data systems and data flows so that we're using it, not not trying to replace it. Um, that's that's one of the big challenges out there. Um, so I have another question from uh, from uh, okay. So first, I'll, I'll I'll take one. I'll take one two more questions, and then we'll move on to the next panelist. Um, so first of all, have you? Have you, I guess, um, is the Alliance using satellite imagery or other types of spatial data for assessing large scale impacts of COVID-19 on agricultural food production? And if so, what are some of the observations you've made? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think I'm, I'm one of the, I've been for the last two, three years really pushing the satellite side of things because for years, I'm a, I'm a, I kind of come from a geospatial background. For years, satellites have been useless for agriculture. It's just the the, the pixel size was too big, um, the temporal re res resolution was difficult. It was too expensive. It was just too hard. 
to really use it for real time understanding of what, what is happening in agricultural systems. Now you certainly can. Um, I think um, what we, the, the reports I was, the, the numbers I was showing on deforestation is are our systems looking at um, deforestation monitoring. On the agricultural production side, there's been some really interesting stuff from ICADA um, in India that we've been, uh, that I've been watching a beautiful kind of, actually a very fascinating interface you can access, which shows kind of pre and post lockdown um, what's been happening and comparing to previous years of whether we are late in planting, whether production is kind of up to up to the levels of comparable to last year and so on. And it's, it's really, it's really been quite uh, illustrative on major changes going on in terms of planting dates being shifted back because farmers are having trouble accessing labor uh, inputs and so on. Um, um, and also just less area getting planted because they don't have access necessarily to capital. So, so yes, there's, there's a few examples of this. I do think we need much better, bigger, global scale kind of monitoring of this kind of stuff. It's a, that's one of these grand challenges that I think we now have the know-how to do. It just needs a big uh, injection of ambition um, and uh, a partnership to get it going. But it's, it's, it's satellites, I think, are a big part of the solution. Thanks, Andy. Last, last question from Kathy Kao. She asks, um, from your observation, will the digital development be more national focused and less open for global due to the pandemic? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. I mean, that's one of the un, undeniable trends that we're seeing is localization of food systems. Um, I'm personally absolutely thrilled that suddenly now I can with my phone order direct from an organic producer uh, four, uh, four miles away from me. Um, so, you know, that, that is happening and digital tools are, are, are facilitating that kind of uh, connection of consumers much closer to uh, agricultural produce. Um, I, I think um, that will continue. I wouldn't say, you know, I think the, the solutions for the, you know, digital don't, uh, you know, they're, they're both national very local, national, and international, and we need to be pushing on all three of those things. And you know, we still have 80% of the food that the world consumes is coming from another region. Um, and so, whilst in this recovery, we may see uh, you know a shift in that, it's still a, la a massive pro uh, proportion of the global food system is trade and movement of goods uh, over borders. And so, you know, we can't take our eye off that, but certainly digital tools on a local level are really, really transforming local market systems in a good way. Thank you so much, Andy. Uh, as with before, we'll be opening up um, the floor again for any questions from, um, from, part from viewers. So um, just hang on and we'll, we'll, we'll try to answer all those questions there. Um, so we'd just like to welcome uh, now Natalia. Um, so Natalia uh, Pishinyaya, she um, is a head of the Agri-Tech and Clean Tech programs at GSMA. Um, so as GSMA documents best practices in the use of digital tools for agriculture, they decided to actually have a closer look at how COVID-19 facilitates the adoption of technology in agricultural value change. So in particular, they looked at um, the increase in demand for specific digital solutions such as mobile money and e-commerce. Um, so thank you so much for joining us, um, Natalia, and uh, yeah, we'd love to, to give you the floor. Thank you so much for the introduction, and it's uh, great to come in after such a good context and a broad context provided by Andy and Sarah. Thank you for doing that. I will build on that. Um, so from our perspective, we have seen um, that the problems that already existed in the value chains, they have been really revealed and we all know about those problems the inefficiencies of the markets inability of countries to feed themselves um, this open markets and like lack of aggregation or storage or infrastructure so we knew about that all and access to financial services was always a problem too for smallholders but we never had to face such um, massive consequences in such short period of time due to such gaps. And I want to start by saying that digital technology by no means can solve all the problems that can support uh, some of those fixes. And uh, 
it by no means removes the responsibility to build more adequate infrastructure. Cold chain is, is one of those. I think roads and vehicles and transport and processing equipment is also really, really needed. Otherwise, we will be facing the problems with food wastage either due to pandemic or other types of crises which are coming our way, including climatic crisis. So it's just really a reminder about all the problems we already had on the food food systems. Um, and I think just the, the most critical ones in terms of what affects farmers at the moment before I jump into the digital uh, kind of exciting part of what's happening. Um, again, building on what uh, Andy and, and Sarah have spoken about, but we have seen a dramatic change in the demand uh, from global markets in particular. And I just want to remind us that agriculture is not only fresh fruits and vegetables, but it's also horticulture and there's also cotton and there are roses and there is a decreased demand for like majority of commodities right now around the world. And uh, this global demand has been uh, changing dramatically. So an example, just Kenya is one of the major suppliers of fresh roses for European market and the global demand has dropped by 50% due to the pandemic, which affected the farmers who now have to think about other ways of earning uh, their livelihoods. Um, but also there is a change in demand in local markets. And I think uh, we are aware of how uh, the, there was a drop in attendance to the open markets. There was a surge in, um, let's say, online consumption. Um, tourist sector has pretty much closed and the demand from hospitals, uh, sorry, um, hotels was reduced and the schools was, was reduced as well because schools were also major buyers for some of the some of the foods. So now the farmers have to adjust to the changes in the market, but they don't fully understand what it means for them and how they need to diversify and for how long. Um, and they face an immediate financial implications, but they also will be facing long-term ability to invest in the next season, and as well as an uncertainty of what exactly they need to be producing right now. Um, I, um, I feel like the, the major kind of things standing out there is uh, the ability of countries to also feed themselves in this situation, which we always thought was a kind of a nice idea, but right now it's a real test. And uh, the ability of value chains to respond and redirect some of this produce to, uh, to where it's needed is, is really um, um, kind of like, been again tested, but we also see this uh, slowly happening. Uh, what we don't see happening that quickly is, of course, the investment and in infrastructure. So even the, the e-commerce players that um, Andy is mentioning is possible now in Colombia to order from a farmer four kilometers away. But even that produce sometimes has to be um, repackaged, stored and uh, redirected and uh, barcode. And this infrastructure needs to be in place. So even such players struggle right now to scale up quickly because of this um, infrastructural gaps. Um, in terms of the digital tools more specifically, so we of course see the digital as a kind of a, really a, a push towards more of agility within the value chains, more transparency and information, ability to plan and respond. Um, the, ability to close the loop, um, kind of or close the, the local um, demand for produce with the supply that already exists if we just had the information about where produce is and where the demand is. Um, and as I think there is a much bigger question there about digital tools ability to increase farmers um, resilience, which is ability to withstand shocks in, in multiple ways and access to financial services is an essential one there. Um, so when it comes to very specific tools that we have seen being adopted at the moment is number one, I have to say it's mobile money adoption, especially in East Africa, we see a massive surge and um, that is also partially due to the fact that government recognized that that's an essential service right now. And they have reduced the limits on the transactions um, 
as well as the wallet sizes, which were sometimes a barrier for the adoption. And right now we see the increase both in the number of wallets, especially in, in among rural population, which usually would prefer cash. So they are now um, adopting mobile money wallets. There is an increase in the number of transactions, but also the, so it's the value and the volumes are both going up. Um, but most of the increase is happening in the low value transactions. We're talking about like under 10 US dollars, really. This is the, the transactions which are now uh, surging. Um, we see the second kind of big trend is the increase in um, agricultural or food e-commerce. That's something again, um, Andy alluded to, but it's happening all across the globe, which is very interesting. So it's both the Latin America, Asia and Africa. And uh, uh, we see the increase depends on like uh, where, what scale the, the player had before the um, the crisis hit and their ability to respond quickly, but uh, they report up to 8%, uh, sorry, sorry, up to eight times increase in the daily orders that they have to meet at the moment. So they start adding more farmers to the supply chain. Uh, but as I mentioned before, the problem right now is, is infrastructure as well as optimization of such of those processes to be able to respond and deliver to, to a lot of customers locally. Um, a good example of that is um, a player Twiga in Kenya that right now signed um, a, a partnership agreement with one of the largest e-commerce players there called Jumia, and they are now allowing um, like major um, cities in, in Kenya to um, get fresh produce online uh, directly from farmers and the farmers have been paid by mobile money as well to reduce the cash um, um, exposure. And um, I think there is another kind of big and less immediate trend, but um, for the value chains, which are sourcing uh, for from smallholders kind of a bit more through cooperative route or aggregator route, um, this crisis has really demonstrated the need for digital tools because you want to have digital communication extension services because farmers don't want right now extension services on their farms. Uh, but at the same time, they need the information about um, what else they need to grow, what's the new standards, what's the new demands. Um, so this kind of like procurement of sad, sudden procurement and sudden development of digital tools for communication with the farmers um, is a bit surprising for us because that could have been done early on by businesses and cooperatives and this option was always there, but it was never that critical. Um, the, however, the businesses that already invested in the digital tools, they know where the farmers are, they know what they grow and what stage of the planting they're at, and they can even pre-finance them now or aggregate the produce and redirect it if they have those like um, information about the farmers, their supply base. And I think the bigger opportunity, and we probably it's a bit too short right now over time to say whether we have seen it, and I think it's a longer term opportunity, but the fact that in rural areas, we really don't have that much of a range of financial products available, and the fact that right now farmers will need access to these products to be able to plan and recover and do better like next season, um, I think that's a big concern for us. I'm not sure it will be available in the market that quickly, but the need to, to make sure that the services are available is really there for the long term. Um, so let me stop here because I, I feel like we still have a lot of <laughs> you, questions out there. Actually, it was very interesting what you said about um, the farmers uh, not wanting the extension um, tools on the farm and that now they're looking to alternative uh, uh, tools that that you were surprised that they were adopting just now when they could have done that earlier. Um, it speaks to a bit more of a culture change around um, digital innovation. Um, so I have a question here from, from uh, Kathy Kao from China, uh, who also is asking about this. She wants to know what you think about live streaming market slash sales for agri products. So for example, meaning farmers use um, mobile apps like TikTok, Alibaba, or online video apps to show how they not only sell products, but produce products as well. Um, and Or from where and in the meantime, 
what I guess where they sell their agri products. Um, as she says, it's a it's a new normal now um, there in China in terms of of uh, agri product sales. Yeah, I just want to say this is now a phenomenon across the globe. <laughs> so it is it's great to know it's also happening in China as well. Uh, we have observed this um, in India, UK, Colombia, Kenya. So it is, it's great. And I just want to say that uh, not everything is happening. This is a very good comment. It's not everything is happening through the platforms which were already established, but farmers are trying to come together now through the use of social media tools and uh, aggregate together and look for alternatives. Um, how businesses will make use of those informal social media channels is still a question mark. Um, I think we'll, we'll still, still there to see what this will look like. <laughs> um, so I have another question from, uh, from another audience member. Um, they ask, uh, this is Jorge Izar again, and he says, with some of the worst impacts from COVID in agriculture happening to humans in or around the wholesale market of processing facilities, what could be a solution to protect human lives without compromising food security or food provision? Is it a question to me? Or I, it looks very broad, like yes. it is on... <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's quite broad, but um, um, you can you can answer if you like. Okay, I I think it is something to do with like the processing facilities and the maybe, actual maybe. process of taking the product to the market. I think Andy, if you can help me here, that would be great. I, that just my five cents is like, if there is an e-commerce platform and they actually packaging and educating the farmer on the quality of the produce they're taking, then they should comply with the requirements, the local requirements and WHO requirements on handling food produce, which they do. When it comes to a bit more of like farmers aggregating themselves, like this is where you can't really control how it will be done. So um, within the current e-commerce businesses, I know that they are trying to expand in a kind of responsible way. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's. I think it's referring to we've seen big, you know, headline news stories on meat processing uh, uh, plants, and um, in each country, I'm sure every single country has seen one way or another, kind of these these wholesale markets as aggregation points of interaction and points of outbreak. In in Beijing, for example, most recently, the 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 kind of the, the new outbreak that happened came came about around a, a wholesale market as well, you know. And so as as lockdown has shut down so many things, but food as a basic need kept open, and these wholesale markets then became kind of a a focus for a lot of these things. I mean, I just like I mean, these digital platforms that are reducing those those wholesale middle section sectors in the market system is helping. Uh, you know that that's that's one way of of reducing those interaction points it's 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 when where people are aggregating that we're having the trouble but if you eliminate that by much more point-to-point -point marketing you're 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 easing the, pre the the pressure on that i mean the solution though is you know you're, you're still going to need these wholesale wholesale markets uh, you just need very very strong bio, biosecurity protocols in place that you need to be very careful around those points thanks thanks andy for for uh, clarifying that and, and adding your own perspective um, look, we're going to move on to, to Brian. We're going a little bit over time here. Um, so uh, Brian King, he's actually the coordinator for the big data, uh, for the platform Big Data and Agriculture. Um, and so the platform is uh, it's a global program of the CGIR consortium centered on digital transformation of food systems worldwide. So Brian has led programs leveraging transformational digital technologies, mostly in developing economies to establish early uh, internet networks and policies, build sustainable rural internet and license mobile operators among others. So um, Brian, uh, if you, if you uh, take the, wanna take the floor and maybe you can talk a little bit more about um, what you see in the future for uh, how we might build or rebuild more resilient food systems. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, and thanks to the other panelists for making uh, any comments I could have. Almost all comments I could make superfluous. Um, really great observations, really great richness of, um, of experience. And it actually points to something that I think is really important for how do we build this adaptation we're talking about? How do we build back better? And it's these networks, these kind of sense-making networks. Um, we've had, you know, we've had people looking from a, a development funding and finance perspective, from a different research perspective than than the program I lead typically uh, typically works on, uh, in terms of, of its of its regional focus. And um, and then we've heard about um, more farmer and food system facing services um, over digital um, from Natalia, and so. Um, you know, I think that there are these kind of sense making conversations happening all over the world right now, and that's absolutely what we need to be doing. Um, you know, so I think that what I might be able to add is a, a bit about is how um, even, you know, very capable uh, global actors, very capable national and local actors um, all over the world have been caught a little bit flat footed um, by this crisis. And, um, you know, ev everywhere from uh, uh, the units in the Food and Agriculture Organization recognizing that they don't have the, the, the timeliness and the granularity of information that they need to act at a global level. And similarly, we're seeing at regional, continental, and, and even at local levels to, to even diagnose what's going on. Um, and, and know what to do about it. And so, um, you know, we've heard, uh, you know, Sarah talked about many different types of food security crises unfolding and unfolding differently uh, ac uh, across um, a couple of regions within, within Africa. And that's happening all over the world. We're, we're seeing that, okay, so we know food systems are disrupted. In, uh, they're getting more localized in many cases and digital is helping with that. Um, but they're also disrupted um, at a global level. And that's also really critical uh, for being able to have build global level um, food system resilience. And so the challenge becomes, how is it unfolding exactly by context and how? And so, um, so okay, so our, our, if it's, you know, our inputs uh, disrupted somewhere, um, is our labor flows disrupted, our food flows disrupted, um, and, and why? And so it's unfolding in, in, in very different ways around the world. And so these kinds of sense-making networks uh, as embodied in this call, and I'm sure there are thousands of conversations going on like this around the world, um, we need to be able to rapidly diagnose and respond, but in ways that are very context-specific. Um, and one thing that I think, um, you know, is, is a bit inspiring actually from this, from all of this is um, when you look at how data standards and data sharing and ethical open data kind of driven collaboration has unfolded in the health space um, related to COVID. So, um, you know, all of the major IT companies host and 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 provide uh, in-kind contributions to the development of, of a global open data set um, called the COVID-19 open research data set. And last I checked, there were about 47,000 scientific papers uh, in that data set. And then um, everybody who has computational resources or some other kind of in-kind support um, are feeding into this, this really remarkable global fast urgent collaboration around just data-driven science um, around particular solutions. And so, you know, a program like the Big Data Platform for Big Data and Agriculture, where we've been saying for some time, um, we need global, urgent, data-driven uh, science to help inform the responses. It's kind of like proving out our theory of change uh, in ways that we had not even um, anticipated. And so, and then, and that culture, I think, is actually starting to move into the research space. We've started to see more sharing of, of um, you know, geo-referenced uh, crop data, for example, um, at least among our partners. And there have been a couple of questions about, you know, okay, well, how can CG connect me to that kind of data? Um, you know, so I think that there's this recognition, we need to move down the line towards that vision that was referenced a bit of, you know, recognizing that for just one great example came up during this call about using remote sensing to start to build a high frequency global picture 
of what's going on with food flows and food security. And um, uh, remote sensing can help us to do that, but we need data sharing and ground data and, 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 and data standards to be able to do that. Um, so I think that the, um, you know, the, the, the digital innovation, um, we know we've learned a lot in a few months about how we need to be targeting digital innovation to deal with this kind of crisis, these kinds of food security disruptions. And I think it happens at all levels. Um, so we need, we need these kind of global analytic, high frequency data to be able to monitor what's going on by location and by food system dynamic. And then to be able to then inform um, those who are, are equipped to respond. Um, so Sarah mentioned certain types of um, infrastructure investments or certain types of market system support type interventions that would be very different by context, um, but very appropriate, you know, to, to target, you know, if we can target them well. So <clears throat> from global to local, we need in digital innovation in each, each of these different each of these different layers, the analytics, and then the mechanisms for engaging with food system actors of the type that we heard about from Natalia. Um, I, lastly, I think, I mean, I would be remiss if I didn't put in a plug for our digital innovation process called the Inspire Challenge. Um, we're specifically looking where researchers can partner with other actors as a, of any type and, and pitch us some digital innovations in this like measuring and understanding resilience side of food security, looking at the, the ecosystem health dimensions of sustainable uh, food security, um, looking at food flows of the types that we found that we really need that high frequency understanding of what's happening in food systems because we've all been caught a bit flat footed from the global to the local. Um, and then lastly, also looking at how do we get income to the farm level through uh, interventions that support sustainable practices, be they at farm level um, or, or at value chain level. And so um, I think we know a lot more about how to target digital innovation um, and um, at these different levels. And um, I look forward to engaging with, uh, with all of you about how we do that in practice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, we, we've gone a little bit over time, so I think we might just open the floor uh, to questions from viewers to all the panelists. Uh, we have a few um, pending here. So um, look, I have one that, that keeps cropping up. Um, it's about the use of hydroponics and aquaponics as an enabler for localization of food systems. Um, anybody on the panel, if, if you have a, an opinion on that, uh, please feel free. The I, across the CGI, I'd have to go and look. Um, and in fact, you can search uh, guardian.cgio.org. Is that right? Anyway, um, you can see exactly what's been published across the CG. And I haven't actually looked for hydroponics or aquaponics for that. Um, but one thing we do know is that, um, you know, in 10 years, the world will probably be significantly more urbanized. Um, like most population growth is going, going, going to be in cities. And so as part of a broader theme about figuring out how do we get production more local to consumption, um, it's an important area um, to, 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 to further develop. And just to complement what Brian has been saying about aquaponics and um, hydroponics, uh, aquaculture as a whole, I mean, I think we have seen uh, a growth as if had on our blue portfolio, what we're calling the aqua, uh, aquaculture and fisheries, and simply because it does provide an alternative for the cost of protein, which we understand that food systems needs to respond to, particularly from the African context. We know that most African consumers are not consuming sufficient volume for that. And we know also that livestock systems being uh, rangeland in general, a low production system. So if we only seek to aim to look at livestock as a provider of protein solutions, probably this is a great cost, global cost, also from an ecosystem perspective of GHG emissions, livestock production, um, but we can look at aquaculture as an alternative as well as beans and lentils, et cetera. Uh, still, we do see the need to expand uh, livestock, small stock, particularly production by improving breeds. So that's where I see really what Brian has been talking about, the technologies that can double and triple whether it's milk production or meat in a small poultry system, small goats, sheep, et cetera, that really uh, keep uh, not only from a savings perspective, and I think Natalie really spoke a lot about access to finance, which is a huge gap 
for most smallholder farmers and how can we use then big data there as well in terms of saying, how can we de-risk this? So as a smallholder farmer, how, what should I grow? What mix of crops should I actually abandon on-farm farming and go for aquaculture? And can big data respond to that? I think these are the questions we have to ask ourselves and try to plug in. But definitely aquaculture and the, the, the at least aquaculture is the most, one of the most profitable uh, bits of smallholder farming. And it's something that we should really look at from a poverty perspective, uh, food system, protein, nutrition perspective, and also from an environmental perspective. I think it makes a lot of sense and thank you to have her through that uh, question to us in the group. Thank yeah, you. I think just maybe add to this, um, it is a very exciting area and like I'm personally a sci-fi fan and Isaac Asimov has spoken about hydroponics 100 years ago as like a future of world food. So it's not new. The difficulty there is like, how do you increase the adoption of such technologies by smallholders for whom it is such a big change and potentially new equipment required? And this is the risk, right? So who is going to finance that risk as Sarah has uh, has noted and uh, there is a potential for digital technology of course to also use the sensors make it smart to make it automated but that's also very expensive and there is no one size fits all so to make it um, workable it needs to be customized per each unique case size of the plot farm roof or whatever this is and there isn't yet a very low cost option to use the, the those sensors for small holders as of now uh, but we have seen low cost solutions without digital for hydroponics uh, popping up now in East Africa um, as well so it's it's exciting it's just a question of adoption and scale <laughs> and investment that hinders that from from where we sit Thank you, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everyone, for your for your answers on on this question. It's it's really fascinating to hear all these different perspectives. Um, so I, I want to finish on um, a positive note, and I guess an exciting note looking forward. Um, so I mean, there's been some discussion, even a question here from Jorge again, and, and he's talking about uh, how adopting these. Uh, digital platforms in the global south can be quite challenging, especially given the microculture around these aggregation points. And that's one thing that we're seeing is there's been a real shift in in the culture and and um, around digital innovation and agriculture. And I know this has been one of the biggest criticisms of digital innovation for agriculture is is th this adoption. So. I want to hear some some uh, perspectives on the importance of that culture change, um, what that might mean for the for the future, and then also just from each of you, if you might have uh, one uh, key uh, exciting, you know, something some something you're very excited about, like how this pandemic is going to positively impact um, the way that we look at innovation in agriculture or any new technology that has developed from this that you that you want to that you you feel particularly excited about if you like i'll go i mean i'll go quick i mean i, I for me it's it's i think uh first of all well no, on, on two fronts you know one i mean just these pharma these direct uh, marketing you know, farmer to consumer uh, platforms. I think that's critical. And a number of the, the the kind of questions, you know, Jorge has been going and kind of asking about this at a wholesaler level. That's that's an interesting one. I, I, I don't have examples, but I think it would be really fascinating to look at how how we can use digital platforms to kind of support wholesale uh, trade uh, um, um, business, uh, you know, to right now from a buyer safety perspective, but in the future from a food safety and, a, and, a, and a, an efficiency uh, perspective as we recover. I think that's a really fascinating one. Um, but but the, you know, the, the other one is just the, the, I think we're learning fundamentally as a society to do things much more effectively and efficiently virtually. <laughs> you know, just as a researcher, you know, this is one part of the food system is you know, our, our work on research. We have got so much better uh, doing certain things you know I think I've been very excited by the way we can use 
um, IVR, and we can use cell phones for very rapid surveys to know what's going, going on across huge geographies. Stuff that you know previously would cost us thousands of dollars to survey now just costs a couple of hundred dollars and takes 10 minutes. So you know that that innovation in itself, I think, is is great. It's going to give us much better feedback loops in terms of knowing what's going on on the ground and how we can react better. Um, yeah, no, I think there's so many exciting technologies. It's difficult to respond to that question to say, you know, which one is the most exciting and, you know, what could really unlock um, or what needs to happen. Um, I think we talked a lot about the mobile, the mobile phones and, and, you know, what is possible through them, the interactivity. It also allows the consumer at the other end to either be able to communicate what they want and what they need. If you also look at the the both the, the base the photo capacity is in there, the voice, the text, it unlocks the possibility and also the financial, the, the ability to do financial transactions on mobile phones. Uh, to leverage that could potentially have uh, quite a lot. It also allows for digital uh, footprint and you know allowing lots of people who have been locked out of digital markets to actually and it reduces inequality in that sense. How it needs to be governed, and I think Brian alluded to, to, to some of those points, is one of the big uh, conundrums we still need to find out on. I think for smallholder groups, what it needs to be able to do is to be able to open up that ability to present themselves as viable investees. What I mean is, okay, uh, I, I could take a picture, a social picture, or you could actually help me to understand what is my soil profile and what should I actually grow? And if I grow that here, what is the risk? And can I get insurance to cover what it is that I'm growing? In the event that something happens, a flood comes in, a drought comes in, how can I manage that? And can I then buy insurance and manage those aspects of my life to enable me to actually transform and change uh, my current uh, status to something else? So if we can do that at the palm of the hand, if there is a pest outbreak, I can actually take a picture, send that somewhere, and an expert could come back to me and say, well, that looks like your normal rust disease, use this, or you know, use this solution. Can we get that level of interactivity uh, to large numbers of people? And I think that's where you know, the real transformation will come in, if you can leverage that and have an interactive platform that allows for multiple uses, not only for mobile users in urban spaces to have access to those things, but also rural communities that are essential uh, food producers in our food system. So that's that, the that's questions that I wake up and sleep on and uh, invite anybody interested in this conversation to engage me uh, and other colleagues about. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just add two sounds here that loop it back to where I started. I think digital is not going to solve fundamental problems. So we still need investments in infrastructure and cold storage and uh, customized financial products and digital can maybe help to an extent reduce the cost and access to such solutions. Um, so just want to be careful on like the hype that the digital will solve this all um, and I think even now I'm rereading some of the questions from the chat and I think there is a misunderstanding of how easy it is for the farmer just to put on Twitter that I have a bag of tomatoes and that is going to reach the the individual in the in the city that's not how it works like you need an intermediary with the transport educated staff with the platforms in place and they have an operational kind of process of how long it, um, it should take and they should take the orders and uh, there is uh, quality control because even one bad tomato can affect the whole bag of tomatoes. So there is a lot that has to happen in the middle. And I think there is a big misunderstanding that those platforms, they are just like a matchmaking online, but actually there's a lot of infrastructure that goes behind it. And this is where lots of investment is still needed for those solutions to be operational and for financial services until we have information on farmers, they wouldn't be profitable, accessible, or well-priced because we those 
those uh, solutions have to be adequate to the farmer's ability to repay, ability to sell uh, the uh, previous transactional records and the climatic conditions of the specific farm. Unless you have such information, you can't offer tailored financial products either. So there is just a lot of groundwork that still needs to be done before the, the digital innovation can, can really scale and, and solve the problems we are facing right now. Thank you so much, Natalia. Um, so we are over time now, um, but uh, I just wanted to say two things. First of all, um, we will be publishing a summary of this discussion as well as the video on the Big Data website. Um, and we'll also put these questions that were left unanswered to the panelists um, and we'll try to answer them as best as possible. We'll post those questions and those answers um, on that blog post also. Um, Later on this week, uh, on Thursday, we'll be having another session, uh, the next session in this, in this uh, series. Um, and uh, the sessions will be, will be carrying on, we'll be doing probably uh, about two per week um, over the next five weeks or so. Um, so I encourage all of you to, enjoy, to join if you found this engaging. We'll be hearing a lot more from local innovators, from other organizations as well. Um, including some of our Inspire Challenge um, project teams who um, are doing some really incredible, interesting things using some of the technologies that um, were discussed during the session. Um, we will also be featuring some of the rapid response grant winners. So those are some of our Inspire Challenge teams who have been awarded uh, an, a grant um, to tackle spe COVID-19 uh, specific challenges um, uh, using their, you know, based on their, their current projects. So really uh, stay tuned for that. Um, you'll be, uh, we'll be sending out the registration um, link shortly. So thank you so much to our panelists um, and uh, to all of the viewers who sent their questions through and we'll see you later this week. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you very much for having us. Very lively discussion. Bye. Enjoy your evening.